This is the Olympia Clinic from February, and our speaker tonight will be Lee Bishop. He's going to give us a view of what happens on his railroad in Tennessee. My name is Lee Bishop. Uh, I live in the Olympia area. I uh, lived in this area since 1998. I'm from Florida originally, and that is relevant. I'm going to be bringing that up here before long. My layout is an Owen 30 rendition of a fictional alternate reality branch line of the East Tennessee and Western North Carolina Railroad, otherwise known as the Tweetsie. It's been in several magazines lately. Uh, matter of fact, it's in uh, this current issue model railroader they finally ran one of my pictures and uh, trackside photos i'm very happy with that train masters tv video actually has a segment on it that just if you're if you're on that service how i got started with all this stuff most people model the area that they're from i was not from that area that said my mom and dad were my parents were born in a place called stony creek which is uh, just east of Elizabethan, Tennessee in the extreme northeast corner of the state. The East Tennessee, West North Carolina was about a 60 mile give or take line. It ran from Johnson City, Tennessee, all the way to um, Boone, North Carolina, and was truncated after a massive flood in 1940 cut in half. Uh, the three foot gauge line went belly up 1950. I got interested in this railroad because when I was a kid, uh, we used to go from where I was born and raised in, in uh, Florida. We'd go visit all of our family in, in uh, Northeast Tennessee. All of my relatives lived in one town, uh, the place called uh, Stony Creek. It didn't model a place I actually grew up in or ever actually lived in, but I went there a lot of times. And uh, the first bullet point on my presentation, I wasn't born a coal miner's kid. I actually could have been. Uh, my grandfather, after World War I, actually moved the family to coal country, uh, Norfolk and Western Territory, an uncle describing double-headed, uh, articulated N&W engines pulling coal drags out of where he lived as a little kid. But through twists of fate, I wound up being born and raised in Florida. So my first attempts in the hobby are pretty normal. Uh, got a 027 Lionel set when I was six years old. Played with that. I still have the locomotive, though. I, I kept that. It's on a shelf in my layout room. But as a kid growing up, I used to hear about the Tweetsie a lot, which is a, what they call Flatlander name for the railroad. Tourists uh, riding the railroad in the 1930s called it Tweetsie. Is a, nobody knows the origin of the name. You can see I was a, a fan of the railroad for a long period of time because the photograph bottom right hand corner is myself at the age of four. Directly behind me is uh, ETWNC locomotive number 12, which thankfully still runs on the tourist railroad in Blowing Rock, North Carolina to this day. I've seen it about four or five times in my life, ridden behind it twice, I think. So uh, in my youth, um, got into HO scale trains as pretty common, played around with it for a long time, got entangled with a modular group in the town I grew up in. I helped found it actually as a teenager, I was the youngest member. Um, I had a series of ever increasingly ridiculous experiences with this particular group to the point where I was so soured on the hobby. I said, that's it, game over. I don't want anything to do with model trains for as long as I live. And I gave up on the hobby for many years. I chased regular full-size trains and would walk into hobby shops, buy books, magazines, things like that. Um, but I, I stayed far from the as far from the hobby as I possibly could up until I found myself in the Pacific Northwest. So the East Tennessee, West North Carolina, when the three foot gauge line went belly up, um, they still had uh, standard gauge tracks from Elizabeth into Johnson City, which connected with the clinch field, which turned into um, eventually became the CSX. You see the tiny little lad in the cab of this locomotive. That's me at the age of 16. Uh, that is a Porter Fireless 060 at the North American Rayon Mill at Elizabeth in Tennessee. Those tracks had the very last place in America where steam interchanged with each other under two different ownerships. This locomotive, which was uh, bought by the uh, Rayon Mill in the mid 30s, either 35 or 36, interchanged with ETWNC standard gauge steam locomotives, uh, one of which is now known today as Southern Railroad 630. 
and uh, which is running today. This uh, ported fireless actually ran until the early 1990s, which was one of the last steam locomotives ran in commercial use in the United States. Never having pulled uh, an inch of passenger service that I'm aware of. The crews were really nice. This was uh, the day after Christmas, 1985. And uh, we just happened to see it run. And it was sitting during when the crew was getting ready to go to Beans. And I asked them if I could sit in the cab. And they said, yeah, just don't, don't, just, just don't start it up. They actually left me sitting in the cab. There's nobody in the cab with me. They trusted me not to take off the locomotive. But it gives you an idea of the kind of visits that we would make. I'd see this engine on occasion uh, still running. Thankfully, it got preserved after the plant got bulldozed, which is, you can't even tell where it was now. Walmart sits on the, on the site now. And unfortunately, all the tracks in Elizabeth are gone. Uh, thankfully, the, the depot uh, that, that's not too far to the left of this photograph is, is still in existence. Okay, so how to get back in the hobby? Well, what happened was um, this fine group in Olympia had a lot to do with it. I started hanging around with some normal rail fans in the area led by Robert Scott to start with. And he kind of introduced me to sort of the inner circle for lack of a better term. So from that, I started to go with him to a couple of op sessions here and there, got to run on a couple of really nice layouts with some really nice folks. You all know who you are. And then I realized that, hey, wait a minute, these people in the model trains, uh, I actually just had a really toxic environment in Florida. These Washington guys are actually really good. Now, I wound up in Washington State because I was an Army officer and uh, married a local gal, decided to stay here. At that point, I realized that I wanted to get back into the hobby again. And just about that time, Bachman decided to build my beloved uh, Baldwin 460s that the ET and WNC ran in ON30. Now, I bought one to put under glass, never intended to run it. One day I hooked it up to a MRC power pack that I ran a little G-scale train around our Christmas tree, bought a piece of o, uh, HO scale flex track, ran it up and down the flex track and realized the thing ran like a Swiss watch compared to all the really crummy HO scale stuff I ran in the 70s and 80s. And as they say, the rest is history. I toyed around with the idea of making a really small layout like a, like a module which is pretty much my only experience in, in layout building. So I had a long conversation with my wife. I have a back bedroom in our house that at that point housed my collection of uh, World War II military stuff. And she pointed out that if I co-located all the bookcases in one place, chopped down a third bookcase, moved a few things around, I'd actually have a room to put some small layout in there. Bless her. That's the reason why I, I wound up getting the layout that I did. Then it became, okay, the superintendent has given me the high green. Now, what am I going to do for an actual layout itself? I'd never, never built a layout before. Nothing other than a small module. I didn't know anything about track plans. I bought a whole bunch of track plan books. I was hopeless. I, I mulled over stuff. I couldn't think of what I wanted. Uh, Robert Scott stepped in and uh, we had a long conversation. I told him the size of the room, what I had in mind, the fact that the bookcases had to be in one corner. And uh, he did more progress in two hours with paper than I'd made in two years trying to build a track plan. Now, his track plan was overly ambitious, and it was HO scale oriented. Track plan was overly ambitious for the location, basically uh, um, shaped like a, uh, an S with an L bolted to the end of it. Didn't really work that well, but... He did introduce one element I hadn't thought of is actually pulling the layout into the middle of the room and not running around all three walls. And I hadn't even thought about that because I had a, a, a closet on one end and a, and a door adjacent to it that I, I, I wasn't going to run a duck around or anything like that. I, I've read too many horror stories about those. I wanted to lay out, you, you, you could just flow. You could, you, you could walk in, you can walk out. You don't have to duck under things, hit your head on stuff, lift things up. No, none of that. It was just going to be part of the room. Once we got an idea of what it would look like, I built all the bench work myself with some help uh, with my wife and uh, borrowed some saws from, from Robert and went to work and built all the bench work just as flat tabletops, pretty much the track plan that Robert had come up with. We're going to do a modified version, a truncated version of that, a less ambitious version. The center of the room where the layout actually came into the room, it kind of made a 180 degree turn. That didn't really work out. So I wound up chopping off one end of that, rotating it about 30 degrees to fit the room better. 
to where the, the center of the lead actually like comes out at a 45 degree angle into the middle of the room. And then at that point, Robert came over. He really helped me out a lot because I hadn't laid track in a gazillion years. I, the DCC was all new to me. Robert insisted that the track be uh, bulletproof was the word he used. So we soldered everything together. He showed me up putting feeder wires, all those things I didn't do before. Before it was all Atlas Flex track. So that shows you Robert's original plan. And I actually made notations what, what, what the locations were going to be. It was HO scale thinking. I was just as guilty of it as he was. So you can see the horseshoe shaped area in the middle of the room. That just didn't really work out because the curves I wanted to make about 22 to 24 inches. Okay, so it's uh, rotated 90 degrees, but it gives you an idea. That's what I wound up with. So it's a single main line. It's 28 feet, which, yes, isn't much of a main line run, but in a 10 by 11 foot room, what are you going to do? The line that runs down Hunter on the right hand side, uh, that wall actually has a really big window on it. The area in Hunter was actually supposed to be like a staging area. I was thinking of Chuck Ricketts layout, the, uh, his area around the crew lounge. I was thinking of something like that and wasn't going to be scenic originally, but then he scenic his, and then I realized, well, yeah, I think a staging area should be scenic as well. So eventually it all became one big layout anyway. But this gives you an idea. There's two turntables. You can run the power around. Down at Buledine, which is the, in the center of the room, the two lines come together at the turntable. So I actually use the turntable for switching moves. So when we got rolling with this, at first it was a plywood Pacific, and I had uh, Greg Bryan, a couple of other people afterwards come over, ran some operations, had a, had a good idea of what, what we wanted to do. I let the crews, the first two crews, I let them, left them to their own devices. I said, you, you run what you think works best. I'm really glad they did. That's the best advice to give anybody. Hand your layout over to somebody else and see what they come up with, because those guys came up with an operating scheme I probably never would have come up with on my own. My idea was originally was going to start with two trains, one at Bulandine, one at Hunter on each end where the turntables are, and run towards each other and meet in the middle. And that didn't really work out. What worked out best, the idea that the crews came up with, start one train at Hunter, run it to the other end of the layout, have somebody in the middle of the layout in the area of Winter, which is the top area of the of the track plan where well, basically where all the switching is done maintain one locomotive there the other runs a train all the way through from point a to point b then that person running the switcher would meet that train take the cars off of it add on whatever needs to be added on the train would continue on to the end of the layout switch what's ever down on that end turn around come back and then meet the cars coming back the other direction that actually worked pretty well, so much so that I thought that the layout originally would take all of about five to 10 minutes to switch five, five car train. Uh, the fastest anyone's done it, a very experienced crew in the last all Oleops did it in 45 minutes. Most people take at least an hour. Okay, so here we are about just shy of a year uh, into the construction. So this is the building section. This is when you first walk into the room. It's pretty much what you're looking at. The first attempts at scenery were done at this point. I'd read a bunch of books, resubscribed to Model Railroader, and realized how much the hobby had changed in my absence. Uh, scenery techniques that were completely unheard of at, at the time I was in the hobby were now being used all the time. The use of pink foam being a, a good example. So what I did was I actually built the fascia first, installed the fascia all the way around the layout with the contours I had in mind. And then I carved the pink foam to match that. And then I put the scenery over top of it. Now, if anybody is curious, it's a mountain railroad. Stony Creek has a lot of ups and downs on it. But the issue was when I built this layout, I didn't know exactly where the tracks were going to go. So I created the footprint and then I put the tracks in where, I, where, where they would be allowed. I took some pencils and marked out where I wanted the scenery to be. So therefore the tracks wouldn't run in those particular places. I don't have the ups and downs uh, a rolling scenery that it probably should have. One of those things that if I knew where the tracks were going to be, I, I wouldn't have done it quite that way. And eventually someday there might be some place I might take a keyhole saw and actually saw uh, areas like, for example, where the military vehicles are parked in the very center of the photograph. I might cut a hole right there, 
drop it, put a depression there just to show that, yeah, it's not just a single level and everything's just slightly above it. But keep in mind, railroads of this type, even in mountains, of course, will be run, uh, would be built in relatively as the flat of the flattest of land as they possibly could get. Though my concept is a fictional alternate reality of a branch line that never existed, there was a real railroad that ran through uh, Stony Creek, Stony Creek Railroad, abandoned, I believe, in 1932. But this gives you an idea of what it was looking like for, for a while until I did a lot of research on scenery. I, I wanted, wasn't analysis paralysis, but I really wanted to get a grip on what the heck I was doing before I started rolling across this with scenery. So this gives you a good idea of where I was. The top is August 18th, 2014. So this is the very first train to make it all the way from one end of the layout to the other. Uh, I think we laid the track in about a week, if that. It wasn't very long. It was only just a few days. We really just hammered that out. On the 18th of August, um, I didn't have the turntables in, but the, I ran the train from one end to the other. In the fifth anniversary, which was in 2019, I decided that I had several of these pictures that I took uh, the first week of the layout's existence. So I did then and now pictures and I, I lined up the exact same locomotive and all the cars in as close of a location as I could. But this gives you an idea of what I did in five years. Now, keep in mind the scenery was actually a couple of years old at this point, but it gives you an idea of the progress. The, the scenery I used, I put ground foam. Well, actually what I did was I matched paint to match the actual soil that was taken from Stony Creek. My mother, on one of their visits, I had her dig a hole with a spade and filled a jar full of dirt and rocks from Stony Creek. And I actually took that jar of dirt to Home Depot and had them uh, match a gallon of latex paint. And I painted the base that color to match the soil. And then I put ground foam over top of that. And then I put static grass. I didn't put a static grass applicator because I tried that, it did not work. So I bought some uh, hiki or hikey, I don't know how to pronounce that, static grass mats. And when you got a small layout like mine, you can splurge on those kind of things. On a large layout, it would, it would be astronomically expensive to do it. But a small layout, you can. So I put these static grass mats all over the layout. Okay, so what goes the layout with anything to run on it? Well, uh, Bachman got me back into the hobby. Once they came out in a manageable scale, O and 30, big enough to where I can do a lot of detail work, uh, small enough that they're manageable, uh, unlike G scale, uh, the peripheral things with it are astronomically expensive. So simply a matter of just buying a few of them. So I bought three of the sound equipped versions. Uh, Bachman came out with the version that I wanted the wartime paint job when the, the ET and WNC's locomotives were painted from the green and gold Southern inspired paint job that, that were applied in the 30s. Uh, in 1943, they actually went to a black scheme, which you can see this is uh, number nine right here. Bachman decided to build that. So what I did was I got three of them, re-lettered one from number nine here, um, and then another one that came out with uh, numbers 11 and 12. One had sound, the other didn't. I bought another one, swapped them out to where they all had sound. So I laid the track to the footprint of the layout, the wiring and the DCC, and I pretty much covered uh, the first attempts at operations. And, and like I said, it, I, I tell people all the time, if you got a new layout and you want to know how to run it, hand it over to a crew and have them tell you how to run it. That's, that's the best advice I could give. Okay, so this gives you an idea of the rolling stock. Keep in mind, there's not a lot of ETWNC rolling stock out there. Nothing's pre-made. There's no ready to run anything, Tweezy. So I have a caboose built by a Deerfield River Laser. That's a kit. That's my first uh, kit. I had to put that together. And uh, I modified some of the Bachman equipment. The high gondolas that Bachman makes no in 30, uh, they're five horizontal boards high. If you cut the top two off, you basically have a shorty version of the Tweetsies converted uh, flat cars into, into gondolas, low gondolas. Yeah, they're short, they're, they're not perfect, but when you're putting together a lot of rolling stock, it, it worked well. So while I was building the layout, I did all the rolling stock before the layout was even ex in existence yet. So uh, here we have right here, you saw the earlier photograph of number nine. Well, here's my number nine. Actually, Bachman ETWNC number 12 modified into number nine. Uh, it's crossing uh, Stony Creek Road at the community of Sadie, which is where my, uh, my dad grew up. 
my mom grew up just up the creek from there. That gives you an idea with the locomotives now. And that I, I did weathering on it. I actually weathered it more than the locomotives probably were running with. Um, they kept them really clean. But your average person would take one look and say, nah, there's, they could be that clean. So I, I, I dirtied them up a little bit. You'll notice the number plate is is very different. Uh, number nine in that time frame, they painted the insert on the number plate. They painted it in silver color. Nine carried that all through World War II. The builder's plate is actually Bachman comes out with the builder plates on these things up until just recently. Their builder's plates are a bronze color with black lettering. Well, we all know in real life it's the exact opposite. It's a black background with bronze lettering. So I made my own decals for the uh, builder's plates using the actual numbers for the locomotives for each individual one. They have the dates and everything right on them. I did them on a computer and printed them out. Same with the number plate. ETWC Historical Society, which I'm a proud member, uh, several of their members have actually gotten together the number plates for 9, 11, and 12, which all still exist. 12, the locomotives still exist in its entirety. But when 9 and 11 were scrapped in 1950, the number plates were uh, preserved and in the hands of collectors and known today. So I actually found photographs of both of them and actually printed them out with my computer on a cardstock and actually mount them on the front to where the number plates look correctly as well. But it's all about the details. So I, I, I did as good of a job as I could. I put uh, covers for the backup lights on the tenders. I I added crew members. Uh, no locomotive period uh, operates on the layout without people in it because it doesn't make any sense otherwise. There's no ghost locomotives running around my layout. But this gives you an idea of, of the general look that I was looking for all along. I was trying to, yeah, it, it won't satisfy the rivet counters. I clearly admit to uh, plenty of mistakes that I've made. The cars aren't perfect. Uh, for example, box cars on the Tweetsy. Some of the box cars were as long as 40 feet. And imagine a 40 foot box car in three foot narrow gauge on track like this. I got pretty broad curves on this layout. 24 inches is the broadest curve I could run from the track plan that you saw. 40 foot box car would derail every single time I tried running that. So the box car is of course way shorter than they would be in real life. Most of the cars are. The previous car, that you saw is actually a um, ON30 IMA. That's a, a wood kit. And that was another pandemic project. As soon as the pandemic hit, Washington State was one of the first states to do a complete lockdown. So we weren't going anywhere. Once I realized it's going to be a few days, I pulled these kits out. I had a stack of uh, five of them and I went ahead and built them. And I built one about a year previously, thankfully, I kept it unpainted and undetailed and to use it as a guide. If you're going to build a kit, usually you build a kit and then you realize all the things you screwed up on it. You'd want another one to build a second one. And that's the one. Well, in this case, I just built the one and then use that as a learning experience to build the others. I now have five of these uh, ubiquitous hopper cars, uh, wooden hoppers that the railroad had. Ironically, an outfit called Western Rails just finally came out with a 3D print of this car. This car is not an easy kit to build. It took me a really long time. I built up an assembly line and I, was, I did a lot of cursing as I built these things. And uh, if you notice the decals on this thing, um, between five cars, there were 105 individual decal placements I had to make for those five cars because each individual character was its own, uh, own decal on wood. So needless to say, that was an interesting experience. I really don't want to repeat that. And I'm really looking forward to getting the 3D print that I did order just out of curiosity. It being an alternate reality concept, I have introduced a railway operating battalion on the layout. And I'm going to go over this kind of quickly. Railway operating battalions were army units under the transportation or quartermaster corps, which were dedicated to either running trains stateside or preparing units to go overseas to run trains in occupied countries after they've been liberated. My concept allowed a Baker company of the 796 Railway Operating Battalion, a fictional unit that I created as well, operating part of the ET and WNC Stony Creek branch as a training exercise for eventually going overseas to run meter gauge and narrow gauge trains in, uh, in Europe. 
So the year is 1943. World War II is now in, well into a year and a half uh, for the American public. They're really starting to grind down at this point. Uh, massive losses to Axis forces uh, overseas have just now started to turn the tide in the Allied favor against the Japanese and the Germans, as well as the Italians. So now we have this Baldwin Class 10 trench engine running around the railroad, exclusively operating over on Baker Company's area. So what I have is I have this locomotive, I have a couple of army marked box cars, the corner of which you can just see right there, those are gray marked USA. This locomotive right here is the new Baldwin uh, Class 10 trench engine with the wow Chuffington sound in it. That is an amazing sound system in that engine. I was so incredibly pleased. It took a long time to break it in, but once I got that thing broken in, it's really, really nice. And I've weathered the living heck out of it. it uh, real life Sarge wouldn't let the locomotive get that, that dirty and ugly, but I decided I was going to go for it anyway. That turned out to be an interesting project because O-Gage Railroading uh, wanted to run my review of it, trying to court Bachman as an advertiser. They were happy for me to write a review of this. So I got this in the very first run of the locomotives. I was with one of the first people to get her hands on one through uh, Train World. I wrote the review really, really quickly, got it to them, and I think they were the first magazine to actually get a review out. The review, actually, I didn't realize O'Gage okay, Railroading paid so well for articles because it actually paid for the locomotive and all the detail parts I bought for it later. So it was that was that was a nice thing. Uh, what I've modified this was um, I've created a new number plate for the front end of it like I did the other engines. I added a pile generator right behind the stack. The real ones had kerosene lamps in them. And I wanted to represent the uh, something with running lights on it. But that's, and I also have a couple of Lionel scale GI figures stuffed in the cab, each with arms extended one direction. They're perfect for, uh, for placement in the cab because it looked like they're reaching for the controls. All right, so some people ask me, how did I get it done so fast? Uh, most people don't, don't get a layout quote complete or done. The initial build was done in less than two years. So how did I do that? Even with a small layout, that's a little unusual. Well, I tell people you want to do something every single day. The photograph there shows you really clearly what it was. That's the very first day. There are four, uh, four pieces. I built them like modules. And uh, Robert helped me install them into the room. I test fitted them out on my deck first. And then Robert came in and then uh, I used carriage bolts, bolted it all together. And then we just ran wire through everything and then laid track right over top of everything. But every single day, once Robert left and we had all the wiring done, I made it a point to do something every single day. Now, people ask me, could you have had a bigger railroad? Could you have moved it into another room? No, that's really the best, the biggest room I could have run. I couldn't put it in the living room. My wife said, though, I could have bought an outbuilding, uh, like a 10 by 20 foot outbuilding. We could have put it out back of the property. I could have put the layout in there. She'd have been fine with it. The thing is, I knew that if it was in an outbuilding, Come winter time, I'd find an excuse not to go there. I'd have to run electricity out there. It would be cold in the winter. It would be hot in the summer. I'd be worried somebody would break into the thing because it'd be easy to break into. Uh, there's just so many things. This room, I walk by it all the time. So if it's there, it's showing me that I still need stuff to do with it. So every single day I did something, whether it was 15 minutes or two or three hours, I did something on that layout every single day. And it's amazing how fast that can, that can add up. So the backdrops that I did, um, you've seen in a couple of the other pictures, uh, I don't believe in using photo backdrops. Um, Chuck Ricketts actually gave me a really good idea on his, on his Owen 30 layout. Uh, he said that the backdrop should actually be something modeled. They shouldn't be like a photograph of something. And I thought that was an excellent idea. And frankly, I think people put way too much emphasis on backdrops as it is. I think most people look at the trains. There's a lot of stuff you read in the magazines about backdrops. And I just think people don't get so hung up on the backdrops when you're looking at something in real life. So what I did was I took a cut MDF board with a profile of mountains and just painted it green and put uh, flocking material, the ground foam over top of it looked like faraway mountains and then put a, planted a boatload of trees along the edges of it. There's really nothing there that shows you the uh, transition from the horizontal to the vertical. I got something blocking your view all the way around. And then in the corners, I built up 
the edges of hills and covered those with uh, puffball uh, trees and stuff. I'm, I might be tweaking those later, but at least it, it kind of hides the, the corners to a degree. The structures, um, the majority of them are scratch built. I have two grant line uh, flagstop kits, the Sheepscot building, I think is, uh, or Sheepscot Depot, I think that's what they call them. Those are nice. They're, they're small, they're manageable, they work just fine. I've got two of those. I have a resin Nissen hut, which is a British Quonset hut, much smaller than the American Quonset hut uh, in the railway operating battalion area. Um, that's going to get swapped out for an American Quonset hut kit that I'm still trying to figure out how to put it together. But everything else on the layout is pretty much scratch built. And then what shows up in a later photograph is what I refer to as the $100 cornfield. I tried building a cornfield in O scale and hand making stalks. And I'm an artistic person. I got an art degree and, and I can make things, but I gave up on that. That was, that was just beyond me. So I used, I think it's JTT Scenics, I believe is the name of the company. I bought one package of their corn stalks, which are amazing. They're very well done. On a piece of masonite that I drilled, put furrows down, I drilled holes for the individual stalks, spaced them correctly for a hand cultivated cornfield, which is laid differently than one done by combine. The rows are further apart. It's a little bit bigger than a large sheet of paper. And that piece of masonite, I built the cornfield on it, but I kept buying one pack of these corn stalks after another. So by the time I was done at 424 corn stalks, I drilled the holes randomly along the furrows on a piece of masonite to be roughly about where I thought it would be. And I started planting them in the front of the cornfield, working my way towards the back, thinking I just put some trees back there when I ran out. I didn't run out. I had drilled exactly the number of holes that I had for corn stalks without counting them. To this day, I don't know how that's possible, but I swear I did not count them and then I had exactly the right number of holes. But uh, those things aren't cheap. And again, this is where the advantages of having a small layout work out better because a large layout, I couldn't possibly do a cornfield that was like three or four feet long. But uh, yeah, it's called a hundred dollar cornfield for a reason. Okay, so this gives you an idea of the structure. So this is my second pandemic project. I had a Woodland Scenics Ethel's gas station sitting there. Anyone familiar with that structure knows it's, it's a nice looking structure. It's pre-built. I'd actually backdated a lot of it for the 1940s, but it just didn't look right to me. Um, I had so much scratch built stuff in there. It, it really bothered me. And the thing didn't have an interior and it really started to, to wear on me. So when the pandemic hit and I did all the um, hopper cars, we, the state was still in lockdown. I couldn't go anywhere. I said, heck with this. I have all the parts I need. I can just go ahead and build a structure. This represents the Jay Grindstaff store in Sadie, just down the holler from where my dad grew up. Unfortunately, in real life, there are no photographs of this store. I based this on photographs of a store that was actually down the creek by a couple of miles in a community called Carter. And uh, that was a Texaco brand. Uh, gas station. And Jay Grindstaff store did not have gas pumps that I'm aware of, but I went ahead and, and kind of put the two together. This structure is uh, fully detailed on the inside. Once I got it all together, I realized this thing really screaming for an interior uh, detail project. So I did a lot of uh, eBay purchases of uh, detailed parts and it wound up costing me a small fortune for the interior. But I can't wait for oppositions to roll around again so I can pull the roof off of this thing and show people what the inside of it looks like, because I'm actually very pleased with how this turned out. The uh, screen door is actually bridal veil material. Anyone who has ever been even visited the South or even the Midwest, for that matter, knows without screen doors, people would have uh, never settled in the South. You got to have them uh, in an era before air conditioning. Now, you notice there's a, a pole in the foreground. And there actually is wiring and a junction box uh, on the side of the building. The Jay Grindstaff store is the only structure on the layout that actually is represented by um, electricity. The Rural Electrification Act was still four years away at this point, but this store did have electricity. Stony Creek Road that ran up uh, into the hills did have electricity right along the road. It did not go up in the hollers until uh, long after the war was over. So uh, this has a lighting on the inside. I, I modeled all the windows in an open position to where not only can you look in and see there's something going on in there, but the one thing always drove me nuts is how many structures, we all know, the windows are modeled closed. 
uh, or closed. And, and it always, even as a kid, that always drove me nuts because in my world, growing up in the South, um, we didn't have an air conditioner. We didn't have, I didn't know anybody who had central air, even growing up as a kid in the 70s. So this gives you an idea, uh, not only of what I'm trying to recreate, but the level and detail I'm, I'm shooting for. And this is the uh, station at Beulah Dean. It's the first structure uh, that got added to the layout. The roof is actually uh, plastic uh, laid in before I was really comfortable with doing a lot of that kind of stuff. If I had to do that over, I'd probably yank that off and hand lay a bunch of shingles up there. And I still might do that someday. But this gives you an idea of the level of detail. Uh, it also shows you something about the figures. I abhor a layout that's modeled with uh, figures in, stat, uh, in uh, dynamic poses. A kid with a uh, kite running with a kite frozen in place, to me, makes no sense if, if the trains are moving. So if the trains are moving, how come the people aren't moving? Well, on my layout, they're not moving at all. They're in static poses. They're all standing, doing whatever it is that they're doing. Like, for example, on the right, you have the station master and uh, uh, Brightman talking. And meanwhile, uh, all the ladies are waiting for the trains to show up so they can go to their jobs in the twin rayon mills in Elizabeth, and which is all the passenger traffic the, the ETWC had in that time frame. I actually uh, recreated the bulletin boards. Those are legible. So if you actually get, like with a magnifying glass, you uh, pull up one of the depots and actually look at it, you can actually read it. So there's a poster on the wall to the right of the gentleman reading the newspaper. I have posters on a couple outside buildings. In real life, you wouldn't have seen that much. Most of those things were actually inside a building. But that far recessed away from the roof, I think you probably could see that. All of these details are for the time period. There is nothing on this layout that's uh, represented uh, taking place any time later than uh, the summer of 1943. As a matter of fact, the interior of the Jay Grindstaff uh, store actually has several magazines sitting on the counter. All of them are June 1943, including the, the latest copy of Railroad Magazine at that time. So this also shows some of the other scratch built. To the right is uh, one of the Grant Line structures I told you about, one of the few kits that are on the layout. And that one's lit, got full in interior detail. I like to have figures in places where it seems to make sense, where it tells a story, where you can look at somebody on a layout and say, okay, there's a reason why that person is there. So at the station, you have a gentleman propped up in a chair snoozing, and two young ladies are waiting for their train to show up. You know, there's a dog there. He's kind of sniffing around. But again, everything in a static pose. So that structure is the barrel factory, which ironically, the only real industry on the layout does not get used in uh, op sessions. It's basically just a scenic element. And there was no barrel factory on Stony Creek, but I wanted some large structure to show that, yeah, I can actually build one. So it's a flat built on a, a pine board. Uh, those are coffee stirrers for the vertical boards, and those are grant line castings all the way around. So just weather the living heck out of that. I just wanted something to break up the monotony of, of trees right there. All right, and this is the community of Hunter. This is actually where the staging yard ends and the rest of the layout begins. So there is a, uh, there's a scratch built water tower. There's another scratch built water tower at the other end as well. Uh, this one is actually made out of styrene with metal castings, but that's another grant line uh, flag stop in the foreground. In front of that is a, is a 143rd scale uh, Model T truck. So all the um, wheeled vehicles on the layout, the few that aren't military, uh, they each have their own individual license plate uh, with um, either Carter County, Tennessee license plates with 1943 uh, dates on them or uh, for the adjacent counties. I have a very few civilian vehicles for pretty obvious reasons. Gas rationing is, an, is now almost a year old at this point. And uh, most of the automobiles actually have the gas ration cards in the, in the windows, but they're really hard to see. Right, here we go. Here's my $100 cornfield. I tell people all the time is when you're showing a layout to a quote normal person, they're going to notice things like this before they're going to notice that the number of rivets on the tender of your Penzi K4 are in the right rows. But I promise you people know what a cornfield looks like. So I want to get this element done correctly. And I even have a, a victory garden sign on the, on the second pole of the right there and the obligatory scarecrow in the background. The uh, scratch-built uh, farmhouse, with almost a flat, it's way too shallow of a structure, but it wouldn't fit in there in any other way. And uh, behind the cornfield, there's a woman actually doing laundry. 
and uh, hanging from clothesline is actually prints of 1930s Appalachian quilts, but they're historically correct. Basically, this entire layout to me is a, a love letter to the 1940s. This, this, in my mind, it represents a fictional, stylized, glossed over, admittedly, version of the 1940s, a time and place that I desperately wish could have existed. Uh, and more so than anything else I, that I could have visited somehow. It's, it's not a real place. It's not really a real time. Yes, obviously 1943 actually happened. This version of the 1943 never happened anywhere. But I think collectively anyone who lived in that time frame really wished that it had. This, this is a time frame where no telegrams get delivered, that, that the servicemen were killed overseas. All the men came home. None of them had PTSD afterwards. Uh, the economy went okay after the war was over with. Things went back to normal and everyone was nice, neat, and happy afterwards. Um, I didn't think most layouts are probably to a degree the same, but this is what I wanted. I wanted this all along, and I am so glad more than anything else that I waited until the opportunity presented itself. Okay, so a few things, like I mentioned earlier, it's all about the details. I tell people there's two things you can never have enough of on a layout. You can never have too many trees and you can never have too much detail. Now, does that mean in terms of rivet counting? No, it just means that you want to show people that you thought of that, whatever that is. Like, for example, if, if you lift the roof off of my uh, country store, you're going to see all the stuff that a country store should have. Magazines on the, on the counter are actually from the same month. They're the kind of magazines that people would read. I got two guys sitting in chairs in the middle of the floor and between them is a table and there's an Esquire magazine sitting on the table. Things like that. Uh, the fact that the locomotives on the layout all have crew figures, real coal in the tenders, Every single one of them has a shovel on the front of the tender, and there's a oil can as well for oiling around when the locomotive stops. Even going so far as the foot plates on the locomotives, I painted them down to bare metal, showing where the foot traffic on the top of the foot plates actually rubbed all the paint off. It's a detail you very rarely ever see modeled. I'm a volunteer on the Centralia Chehalis Tourist Railroad. Now, we don't have a steam locomotive running yet. We're going to have it again really soon. I'm a brakeman down there, but I have ridden on it multiple times in the cab, and I noticed those details. So it, that's what I mean when I refer to details. Take a look at a scene, see if anything doesn't make any sense, and then change it. What I do a lot of times is I will stop, walk into the room, look at just a little scene one at a time. Does this make sense? I've even changed the, a couple of pathways where I realized people wouldn't walk that way. They would walk the path of least resistance. So I've torn out scenery and put pathways uh, where people would actually walk instead. Little things like that. You're all familiar with the movie Field of Dreams where they say, build it and he will come. I'm going to say with a small layout is build it and they might come. Uh, the problem with a small layout is uh, you have a really small crew. I need, really need two guys to run the layout. So it's really tough to get just two people. So unfortunately, I haven't had a lot of op sessions. More than a few times, I put out a crew call, what I refer to as putting out the bat signal, and find out that a couple of larger layouts up in Olympia had op sessions going on at the same time. I don't blame people for going to the big layouts. I would too if I were them. Now, if you build it, they might come, but if you build it, they will publish it. The one thing I've been very, very surprised about this layout was how it was received. Other than my first time I submitted something to Model Railroad, every time I made a pitch, the editor loved it, and it wound up getting published. It's unusual. It's different. That's the reason why. Uh, it's not what you see every day, and I'm convinced of that now. Uh, it takes place through World War II because I have a huge interest in World War II history. I've written all kinds of stuff, uh, magazine articles, helped consulting work on books. Uh, a couple of TV projects, uh, even even worked on a movie project that, that didn't go anywhere, uh, done talking head work for the, the History Channel. For those subjects, I've been a World War II living historian since I was 19 years old. And it also speaks of a time my parents would have been little kids at this point. My dad, uh, in the summer of 43, would have been seven years old. My mom would have been six. I have every intention of making figures for them as children. I just haven't found a good basis for that yet. 
and they are going to be on the layout eventually. It's pretty much an acknowledgement of, of, of my mom and dad, the awesome childhood that I had, where they let me go chase down parts of the old Tweetsie even when I was a little kid. So this represents what probably has to be the only fictional railway operating battalion insignia ever created in the model railroading hobby. Uh, every, every army unit had an insignia, which normally was kind of a crest shape. There's a rule on how military insignia are, are designed. There's about three or four different shapes that you can have. This is one of them. What I did was I basically uh, hand drew a uh, Baldwin class 10 jumping over a stump. Now, there's no actual story behind this. I just think stump jumpers just kind of popped into my mind for some bizarre reason. Even though I have written the fictional history of the 796 Railway Operating Battalion, uh, I went ahead and um, drew the insignia, and I actually have uh, signs in front of Baker Company showing the insignia on it. And eventually, I'm actually uh, working with somebody from Etsy right now to actually make a reproduction or replica uh, unit insignia, which would be about an inch tall uh, pins. Maybe you might sell those uh, within the hobby just add, just for the heck of it, just to see whether I can get anywhere with it. But this shows you where I really thought about the fictional history and how far I've actually taken it. All right, so as for the detail, this is a, a gate. They didn't call it a gate, they called it a gap. This is based on a John Krause photograph of the last run of the Tweetsie on State Line Hill in 1950. This is what they used for uh, gates back then. These are uh, horizontal slats held in place by wooden frames for a cow fence and simple wire strung between whatever kind of poles that they could have. So those are the details that I mentioned earlier. My goal was someone in their 70s or so that might have lived in that area through the post-war era could walk into the room and immediately not recognize places because it's all fictional, but recognize the look of it. That, that was my goal all along. Unfortunately, I'll probably never meet the goal. It's very unlikely anyone familiar with Stony Creek, Tennessee is ever actually going to walk into this room. But if they do, I would like to think that I nailed down at least the look of everything correctly. This is uh, the Enzer house I showed you in the earlier slide with the $100 cornfield. You can see the uh, quilts hanging from the line just barely in the right-hand corner. But this gives you an idea of what I really like doing is I like taking photographs from eye level and trying to make them look like older photographs, even though they're digital. I have software I can change and put film grain into them, make them kind of sepia-ish. Getting it look as, as close as you possibly can for a real place in real time, somebody standing there with a speed graphic actually taking photographs. So this is the interior of the Grindstaff store. In the foreground, that's the Woodland Scenics, uh, guys playing checkers. They're not playing checkers. They got a couple of magazines in front of them, including an Esquire magazine. You can't really see it because they're out of focus. This was taken with a GoPro camera that I placed inside the structure and put the roof back on it. And with an interface to my cell phone, I actually took some photographs. And unfortunately, it's about as good as you can get for some because a GoPro isn't built for this kind of stuff. But it shows you level of detail anyway. Um, you have the, the crank phone on the wall. The Grindstaff store did actually have a telephone. Uh, people on Stony Creek, that's where they had to walk to to actually use a telephone. That's all the pictures. FDR on the wall. And uh, to the right of that is the uh, basically loose lips sh uh, sink ships poster right next to a telephone. It just seemed to make a lot of sense to me. Uh, there's a pot belly stove to the left, unfortunately, a little out uh, of focus. And right next to the door, there's a spittoon on the floor, the wallpaper. That's actually from the 1930s. I actually found that in a book. So I scanned that and recreated it. So the wainscoting on the long edge of the floor is a little lower than it really should be. It probably should be about three feet high. But other than that, but that's what I'm talking about historical detail is that that is actually 1930s uh, pattern wallpaper that actually did exist. Okay, so this is the building Depot. This is the far end. You actually saw the other end where the, the shot that had all the figures in it. And it shows you on a small layout, you can actually have a lot of depth if you get the angle just right. You're looking at a depth of about seven feet right here uh, from this spot all the way to the opposite end of the layout. Now there's a open space in between, but you can't see it in the photograph. So this uh, truck in the foreground is a 1940, 41 truck. And it has a load in the back. You'd see limited amounts of uh, civilian automobile traffic. And if you could barely make it out, but the, the bottom edge of the passenger, yep, yeah, there you go. There's the A card, uh, gas ration cards. Most of them, civilians only had what they call A cards, which gave you only just like a couple of gallons of gas. 
Yeah, and behind it, that is the corner of a 1943 Ford GPW uh, Jeep. It's got a pedestal mounted uh, model 19, 1930 caliber light machine gun. Uh, that actually is a 143rd scale model. Now, what I did was I modified that. I put the windshield, uh, put a, a canvas cover around the windshield made out of tissue paper and painted OD green to match the one that's on my real Jeep. And I removed the ammo can from the 30 caliber machine gun because in real life they wouldn't walk, around, they wouldn't drive around with a with an ammo with it loaded. Anyone who served in the military knows in a peacetime training scenario, soldiers don't carry around their own bullets. That's just not how that works. Uh, safety, safety, safety. So um, had that beaten into me by Uncle Sam uh, during my time, and I don't think it changed much in that time period. So that shows you the screen door. It gives you much better detail on that. On the front of the screen door. It's what I call a push bar uh, advertising for a sunbeam bread. And that's correct. And all the brands of the signs that are in the front of the oils, them, uh, the creamsicle, uh, new grape and the Coca-Cola sign, all those are brands that would have been sold in East Tennessee in the 1940s and 30s. On the other side of the structure is a uh, pet milk sign. Pet milk is a brand that actually got started in Johnson City, Tennessee. And even as a kid, Pet milk was all you had, and uh, I'll be darned if I wasn't going to have one of those signs. So I found a 1930s pet milk sign that's on the opposite side, and, but it gives you an idea uh, of the level of detail that I really was shooting for and the weathering I was trying to shoot for as well. This shows you the sign at Baker Company, 786 ROB. I made that sign with the uh, insignia I showed you earlier. Here's number 12 uh, coming into the yard at Hunter uh, with a coal train full of those IMA uh, Owen 30 hopper cars. In the background on the left is the Nissan hut. It looks smaller than what you think of as a standard Kwanzaa hut, normally a much taller structure. That's not out of scale. That's actually a smaller hut normally designed for like about four to six people to actually just bunk out in. Uh, could not find a, a Kwanzaa hut that didn't look toy-like in O-scale. I have a Kwanzaa hut. I'm in the process of building as we can be much larger than that. That structure is going to be gone. But all the military vehicles on the layout are uh, properly marked. They even have the railway operating battalion markings on the front bumpers. Because I ran a motor pool unit uh, uh, in the Army, and I had to get that detail just right. So in the foreground, you see, again, uh, figures in uh, static poses. Uh, those are the Enzer boys. Uh, Mrs. Enzer is going to be really ticked off when she finds out that they've actually skedaddled down to watch trains at the water tower again. They're going to incur her wrath when they get back to the house, I'm sure. This is a water car I made from a busted up Bachman Owen 30 uh, 260. And what I did was I put a drawbar and coupler on the front end, added some uh, grab irons to it, decked the top of the structure, put a water uh, water cover from, a I think, a K-27 brass model in there, spray painted the whole thing, um, kind of a gray color, like uh, sort of reminiscent of the Rio Grande with their uh, MOW cars, made a water car out of it. Um, that was actually featured in the um, 2018 ON30 annual. And that is a standard um, Bachman um, tourist car. I made an army car out of it. Now I have a bunch of GI sitting in it, but it's uh, a simple weathering job on the roof. So I have a, just a couple of uh, army army cars. To the left of it, that's when the cut down um, gondolas. So you cut the top two boards off of one of the Bachman gondola, high gondolas. It's not a perfect representation of a Tweetsie uh, converted flat car, but it's pretty darn close for what you paid for them uh, back when I got it. And uh, in the background, uh, right behind the army car, uh, that is uh, the only refrigerated car because the Tweetsie didn't have them. So I marked that as Stony Creek Southern and made a shed out of it, showing the passage of time because the Stony Creek Southern was the original idea for the railroad, a fictional railroad that got bought out by the Tweetsie uh, in the height of the Great Depression. This is they're just basically there to show the passage of time. And God help me, I actually have a diesel on the layout. Uh, it doesn't get used much now. It's never been used in an op session. Uh, it's a Whitcomb 50 tonner Bachman. I marked it for, I made my own uh, decals for Transportation Corps because I found that a lot of Army diesels were either painted gray or yellow. Very few were painted OD green, a few were. Most people were under the impression that all Army uh, operating equipment was OD green. Not really the case. Very few of their box cars were, were OD green. None of the steam locomotives uh, running for the Army ever were painted OD green, uh, trite 
explaining that to the industry because they still make them in OD green. Even Bachman did. I made my own decals, got Transportation Corps, U.S. Army, the serial number. There's a Whitcomb builder's plate on the lower end of the cab. And the front ends actually have inspection markings, uh, Camp Hollibird, Maryland, 1943, that it was tested. Um, Camp Hollibird, Maryland was where the Jeeps, the original first prototypes of the Jeeps were, uh, were tested. It's near Baltimore. And behind that is uh, Tweetsie number 11. That was the engine that the, the ETWC actually used more often than not. It was the favorite locomotive uh, for the railroad throughout the World War II years. Offered up to the city of Johnson City by the railroad for preservation uh, when they uh, tore up the three-foot tracks in 1950, and they were turned down. And unfortunately, it was scrapped. Uh, thankfully, number 12 was actually bought by some uh, businessmen along with a couple of cars, Removed from Tweetsie country, uh, moved to Virginia for an ill-fated uh, tourist railroad, later bought by a guy named uh, Grover Robbins, um, and now runs at uh, Tweetsie Railroad in uh, Blowing Rock, North Carolina. So this shows you the how I replaced all the um, builder's plates, because uh, the Bachman, they did a real good job with these locomotives. There's a couple of details they forgot, the running boards that are on the cylinders. I, I decided not to add those because re-railing the front truck if you have a derailment it's a nightmare if you put the running boards on that, that were on the real locomotives but i replaced the builder's plates like i mentioned earlier and if you take a magnifying glass and you really get close to that locomotive you'll find the serial numbers actually represented correctly but again this shows the kind of uh, photography i'm trying to recreate All right and this shows you uh, an improvement that i made during world war ii era the backup lights on the tenders, on all the locomotives, they put a metal cover on them. The headlights were actually moved to the top of the coal pile. I didn't do that because that would have required a lot of modification. But sitting on top of the coal pile is the tombstone-shaped representation of the metal cover. Now that's styrene, and I melted that over a rod with a uh, piece of brass rod. I melted it over there with a, with a flame. But later on, I decided I just didn't like the look of it because the styrene was too thick. So I changed it with uh, brass, as you can see there. And I wound up painting that. And I actually looked up. But little details, they're, they're not expensive. They're not difficult to do. It took like almost no time at all to do that. Just bent that over the exact same brass rod that I used previously. Little things like that. They don't cost much. They don't take long to do. But it's just the little details like that. The, the, the little things that I just really want to get right. And here it is afterwards. So it just gives you an idea, just, just little things like that. You just take a look at something and say, hey, uh, this car, this house, this structure, you know, this, this passenger car, whatever, it had this thing on it. Can I, can I add it? And is it going to be that big of a deal to do it? And that's my trench engine again. It shows you the level of weathering that I put into it. Uh, unfortunately, it shows you also the decals don't look all that great when you, when you blow it up really big. But it does show you how Bachman finally blessed them. They finally learned the lesson on their builder's plates. So I did not put this builder's plate on. That actually came like that. Okay, so real quickly, I'm going to show you before and after. Okay, so that's before. The next slide. That's the after. Same vehicle. All I did was I removed the pre-World War II markings from the door. So if you see the markings, the unit markings in the 1930s on cars were on the sides of the vehicles. In the 1940s, they moved them to the bumpers. So I removed that, kept the hood markings the way they were, simply gave it a good hit of dull coat, did some light weathering around, actually added a license plate, a gov US government license plate that would be on a civilian style vehicle. You can't really see it in the picture, I'm not sure why. And I uh, put diluted black paint into the grill. So, so look at the grill. Look how shiny that is. We all know that cars don't really look like that. So you see the difference. Anyone who knows old cars knows that, yeah, there's, it's a grill for a reason. Those are gaps in there. So little, just little things like that. That project took me all of about maybe an hour to do. Remember what I mentioned earlier about every now and then I'll stop and look at the layout and say, does this make sense? Does this look right? Uh, one day I took it took a look at the original Stony Creek Road and said, man, that ain't, that ain't right. Uh, the original road was gravel, so I changed it. I scraped it down to the bare plywood and started over. So you can see it went from a black top to this. I based this upon a, uh, a Little Rock Road, actually. If you've driven it, you, can, you know that that's uh, gravel uh, with, with, with oil on it. Now, Stony Creek Road was a, was a two-lane road, but I didn't have the room for it. So it, I, I pulled my modeler's license out of my wallet and placed it down on the layout and went to work. 
uh, you can see the ruts are actually lighter color um, on the surface where the cars would normally travel. Because if you look at a road like that, you'll see where the where the wheels go through all the time, it's a lighter color instead of a darker. And I put uh, just a standard, some drips of oil, things like that coming out. And I even have uh, marks where somebody squealed their tires real fast uh, on the far side of the crossing. Because sometimes if you see the white car to the left there, that is a Tennessee Highway Patrol car. Uh, now you'd never see a Tennessee Highway Patrol car on Stony Creek Road, but uh, I figured, I, people think that it's because they saw the cops and slammed on their brakes. I tell them because they saw a train coming slam on their brakes because there's no grade crossing signs here. Okay, I think we've come to the end. Um, this is the only uh, advantage of having a window on your layout. If you open up your blinds and you wait for the sun to set just right and you hit the angle just right, you can get really neat shots where very little in your picture is actually your model trains. I just put that in there just to show that, hey, just never stop thinking of new ways to take photographs. Always look for new angles. Uh, try to do out of the box thinking. A, lo a lot of people would, would never even try to think to take a photograph out of an open window on a layout. So that's, that's pretty much it. Um, I'd be happy to entertain any questions at this point if anyone's still awake. We got a question from Tom Gravenstein about what kind of turntables did you use? Oh, they're both uh, uh, Pico. One is the uh, Owen 30 turntable they make and I deck that. The other one is, so it's the OO scale turntable. I want it to look different. I want it to be, you know, two different ones, not the same one twice. Uh, the pit is the same. It's a 12 inch bridge. And it, they're, they're Armstrong turntables, there's no motors. And that's another thing I didn't really discuss. I didn't mechanize anything on this layout. All the uh, turnouts are run by blue points from, from the fascia, I got pulls on the fascia. The turntables are, uh, are, are Armstrong, you turn them yourself. The Pico ones are neat because the, the contact is a split ring with two, two prongs coming down from the bottom of the, uh, of the turntable. So once it breaks 180 degrees, yeah, it'll reset the sound on the, on the locomotive once it resets itself, but you don't have to do any fancy wiring or anything like that. So I, I basically made the layout bulletproof. Uh, I wanted to give it the fewest opportunities to, to bite me in the butt. So I'm going to close up the clinic here with a lot, couple more slides, and then anybody else who wants to stay and talk, um, we can still do that.